The Old Testament lesson for the Nativity of our Lord is from the prophet Isaiah, the 52nd chapter. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice, together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Here ends the reading. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. The epistle is from the letter to the Hebrews, the first chapter. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Here ends the reading. Please stand. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own. And his own people did not receive him. But to all who did to receive him, he, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hear these words from our Gospel lesson. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Dear friends in Christ, I don't know what the holidays are like at your house. One of the things that we've done quite a lot of over the last couple of weeks and days uh, is we have watched a bunch of Christmas movies. We haven't gone all the way to break out the old claymation ones from the 1960s or 70s or whenever that was. Uh, but we've watched a lot of the ones that, that we watched as kids, a lot of the, the Christmas movies that were coming out. It seems like every year there was a new one. And in those Christmas movies, there's something that happens in just about every single one of them. And perhaps it was part of your childhood or, or part of uh, your kid's childhood, you children who are here. There's always that scene where the, where the kid goes to visit Santa Claus. Remember, they sit on his lap. Maybe he's at the mall or maybe he's at some Santa's village that's been set up. And what does he always ask them? What do you want for Christmas this year? I think that's a, a valuable question that we could ask ourselves, not necessarily in terms of the gifts that we hope are under the tree or we've already opened from under, under the tree. But the question is this, what do you want for Christmas this year? And I will be blunt and I'll be honest with you and say that one thing that I think most of us would like for Christmas this year, one thing that I would love for Christmas this year is a normal Christmas. It seems like we've had two or three years of craziness. It seems like things are just falling apart. And I don't think that that has any, any uh, um, maybe it's just a coincidence that that's about the time that I showed up here. That's, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But it just seems like things are falling apart all around us. All I want for Christmas is some normal, is for things to be the way that I remember them. I want to live a life where I'm not constantly afraid, where I'm not constantly worried about what's going to happen next or what's going to be on the news or what I'm going to learn about um, that I had no idea about this time three years ago. That's all I want for Christmas. But I think that oftentimes this is true of the things that we want and covet and desire at Christmas and the rest of the time as well is that it's not always the best thing for us. We desire normalcy. We desire to go back to the way that things were without looking at the fact that the way that things were was actually quite broken to begin with. You see, we can make an idol out of anything. That's what our first parents, Adam and Eve, taught us, is that we can make an idol, a false god, out of even something as simple as knowledge. The knowledge of good and of evil. Adam and Eve said, well, that's something that I'd like. And sure, that fruit hanging from the tree looks delicious. And, and well, maybe God even wants us to gain this wisdom. And they fell into sin. In fact, all sin is idolatry of one shape or another. And so the things that we want, the things that we desire at this Christmas and, and all the time, our prayer should be that they would align with God's will for us. God grant us our daily bread. Nothing more and nothing less. Nothing more so that we don't become conceited, thinking that we have earned more, that we deserve more, that we are entitled to more, and nothing less so that we don't covet it, so that we don't 
become begrudging towards our neighbor who has more. God, give us our daily bread, nothing more and nothing less. The way that things are and the way that things used to be. John's gospel begins with these beautiful words. You'll remember perhaps that Matthew's gospel began with a genealogy. A lot of us in this neck of the woods love our genealogies. We love studying our family histories and everything else. Well, Matthew is the gospel for you. He wants you to know exactly how Jesus is tied to the promise given to Abraham. Last year, we spent an entire year in the gospel of Mark. And you remember that the gospel of Mark was a, a gospel of action. He begins straight from the beginning, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then we fast forward all the way to the baptism 30 years later. Luke's gospel that we've heard last night and for the last couple of weeks leading up, Luke has a detailed, detail-oriented, he has a, an in-depth look at the first things that came about as Jesus and his cousin John, who bore witness to Jesus, came into the world. But John stands out from the rest. John says, we're not going to start with, with the Virgin Mary. We're not going to start with the angel visiting Joseph. We're not going to start with a genealogy. And we're definitely not starting with Jesus' baptism. He says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. I love the fact that we get all the way through this gospel lesson. We get all the way down to verse 17 before John even thinks to mention the name Jesus Christ. Instead, he starts with this telescopic view, this view out into the cosmos of who God is and the fact that God is described as a word and as light. How beautiful is it that on the first day of creation, God's word echoed out into the blank nothingness of non-existence and said, let there be light. And so there was light. And that light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness cannot withstand it. The darkness flees from it. Have you ever thought about that? That's exactly what happens when you turn on the lights. The darkness flees. It hides behind objects. It creates shadows wherever it can. But where the light shines, there can be no darkness. But then John pauses. John pauses and he says, There was a man sent from God. His name was John. Not the writer, but of course the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light. He himself was not the light. But you know, light is hard to perceive when it's not shining on something. And so there stands John. We've talked about John throughout the season of Advent. The fact that John stands as that finger pointing towards Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God, he who takes away the sin of the world. And the light shines on him. But that true light, that light that gives light to everyone is coming into the world. John is very clear, says that he was in the world and, and even though the world was made through him, the world didn't know him, the world didn't recognize him. Jesus echoes these same words when he's talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you remember. John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes along, he's the one who should get it. He's the teacher in Israel. How can you do such amazing signs? And Jesus tells him, you must be born again. How can this be? Are you a teacher of Israel and still you do not understand these things? He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake on the pole in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It doesn't stop at John 3.16 though, does it? For God did not send His Son into the world, verse 17, to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Jesus continues, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe 
is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. And here's my point. Jesus says, The light has come into the world, and the people loved darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Dear friends, this speaks to our experience. The fact that we long for normalcy, the fact that uh, when I woke up this morning I was wondering to myself what a normal Christmas in Warda might be like. Definitely not 80 degrees outside this afternoon. But normal is broke. Normal is marred beyond recognition. Normal is not the way that God intended for things to be. Because we are a people who love to sit in darkness. We are a people who would prefer that our deeds not be under the spotlight, under the microscope. We are a people who are comfortable with the way that things are. God save us from our comfort. God save us from our complacency. And God save us from our covetousness. But that's the joy of Christmas, don't you see? That's the good news for you and for me is the fact that that light keeps on shining, that that light cannot be snuffed out, that light cannot be dimmed, it cannot be extinguished. That light shines in the darkness and the darkness of your hearts and of mine cannot overcome it. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. John continues, The Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, filled with grace and with truth. You see, John bore witness about him. He cried out, This is the one that I said, He comes before me because He ranks before me, He existed before me. Even though John is six months older than Jesus, he understands that Jesus is the one promised from of old. And then John the Evangelist continues, From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know, no one has ever seen God. There's a whole section of the Old Testament that deals with seeing God. You don't get to see God. You don't get to see him according to his glory, according to his majesty, according to his might. If you see God, you are, in the words of Isaiah in chapter 6, undone. You're toast. Because God is holy. God is perfect. God is righteous. And God is justly angry on account of our sins. No one has ever seen God, John tells us. But the only God who is at the Father's side, that's Jesus... He has made him known. That's the joy of Christmas. Jesus comes to make God known to us, to make God knowable to us. Because we who dwelt in darkness, upon us now light has shone. Now sure, our, our knee-jerk reaction, our, our initial inclination is to, to shield our eyes from that light to try and to hide in a shadowy place, to try to, to find what things used to be like and the way that things used to work. But Jesus, he directs us to step into the light, to confess our sins and to be forgiven once more, to come and to see his glory because his glory is the same glory of God, now wrapped in human flesh, now made to be a brother for each and every one of us. Now made to go, to lay down his life on the cross. Because that's the purpose of Christmas. That's the reason that God sent forth his son. Not just so that he could be cute and little and innocent and holy and perfect and blameless and wonderful. Not just so that we could sing beautiful hymns about little baby Jesus. But so that he could grow to die for you and for me. And to rise again as a pledge, as a token, as a promise that we too will rise again. 
and that our faces will shine just as his does. In the name of Jesus.